As we prepare to hear from God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we are gathered here this morning to hear from your word. Lord, we pray that as we have worshipped you, that you have been honored. And we trust in faith that our worship has been very pleasing to you. Lord, we offer all of who we are. And we ask that you would take us and that you would use us and that you would mold us for your glory. We thank you for the gifts that have been presented to you this morning. Lord, they represent just a small part of the many ways that you have blessed us. And we ask that you would use these gifts to further your work in the world. Now, Lord, as we approach your word, I pray that you administer to us in a powerful way. I pray that those burdens that we are carrying, that we would release them into your hands, knowing full well that you can tend to and care for each one of them. Now clear our hearts and clear our minds so that we may hear clearly from you. In Christ's name, amen. Life in the Roman Empire during the first century was miserable. Devastating plagues caused the healthy to flee to other regions. The practices of abortion and infanticide were widespread. It was a very harsh climate for female children because male children were prized in that culture. It would not have been unusual for the parents of a baby girl to take that infant down to the outskirts of town or to the seashore and simply abandon her and allow the elements to take their inevitable toll. In this culture, sexual promiscuity was rampant. It was, first century Rome, a morally repugnant culture on every level. It is against this cultural context that St. Peter a former fisherman turned church leader, a disciple of Jesus, wrote, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And you hear the words of Peter's rabbi. You hear the words of Jesus echoed in his ministry. And the first century Christians did just that. They lived such good lives that pagans became Christians. Into this moral abyss, they stepped in and became an irresistible influence and force for good. They preached against the practices of abortion and infanticide. They counseled their converts from every background to keep their babies and to raise them. They went to the outskirts of town and they rescued the abandoned girls. They adopted them and they erased them in the faith. When plagues hit and the healthy would flee to other areas, Christians stayed behind and they stayed put. Somebody's calling. I'll just wait. It went to voicemail. And I think the message left was something like, Christian stayed behind. <laughs> but they did. When all, everyone else left those areas, <laughs> this, when everybody else left those areas, the Christian stayed behind. And they tended to those who needed medical attention. They preached virtue. They preached sexual purity and faithfulness. They were winsome. And the joy of the Lord was evident on their lives. And non-Christians were attracted and converted to the faith. The faith spread from a few thousand in 40 AD to over 4 million by the 4th century when Constantine finally legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. In truth, it had been practiced in word and deed for centuries. This is exactly what Jesus envisioned when he gathered his disciples on the hillside and taught them about life and taught them how, how life was to be lived God's way that would often find his disciples living in the opposite direction of the world around them. 
And he gathered those disciples together on the hillside. And he said, you are to be the salt of the earth. And you are to be the light of the world. And they were. They were. And that is our text for this morning as we continue our series based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount called Life in the Other Direction. Our text is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. It is a very familiar text. And so I'm going to read a different translation this morning. I'm going to read Eugene Peterson's message translation of the Bible and allow this text, hear this text with fresh ears this morning. Listen how it reads. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Now, this famous passage, you're to be salt and you're to be light. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Jesus is doing several things here. First of all, he affirms their source of goodness. He says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. He does not say, if you try hard enough, He does not say that if you try hard enough and you memorize all the rules that you will one day reach saltiness and one day you will be bright. He doesn't say that if you have enough good deeds that outweigh your bad deeds, your sins, that you will be salt and light. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, you are. He proclaims their identity right from the beginning. The identity as salt and light is an identity that God's people inherit when we are born again. It is nothing we earn. It is nothing we memorize. It is given to us. The capacity to be salt and light is given to us when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we see this theme coming out over and over and over here at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is life in the other direction. It's about God's grace and God's goodness flowing through the disciple. Now this is what makes Christianity different than other religions. Christianity is all about your relationship with Jesus. Religion, including moralistic counterfeits of Christianity, are all about rules that you follow in order to earn God's favor. Timothy Keller, one of my favorite writers, writes this. Traditional religion teaches that if we do good deeds and follow the moral rules in our external behavior, God will come into our hearts, bless us, and give us salvation. In other words, if I obey, God will love me and God will accept me. In other words, obedience, then love, and then acceptance. But the gospel is the reverse of this. If I know in my heart that God has accepted me and loves me freely by grace, then I can begin to obey out of an inner joy and inner gratitude. Religion is outside in, but the gospel is inside out. And so we see here at the beginning, Jesus is sharing with the disciples where their source of goodness comes from. It comes from him flowing through his disciples. The second thing we see Jesus doing is setting his strategy for renewal of the earth. God is at work in the world making all things new. God is at work in the world setting what has been marred and scarred by sin, setting those things right. He's bringing about the renewal of all things. He's making all things new. There's this beautiful epic storyline to Scripture. God in the beginning created all things. Then disruption and rebellion happened. And when sin entered the world, death and decay and disease entered the world. But God rescued his creation by sending his son to die for the world and to redeem it. 
And God is at work through his spirit and through his church to make all things new, to renew and to recreate his world, to be the world that he wants it to be. And one day in the fullness of God's time, God is going to call this renewal project together. He's going to complete this renewal project and the world will be as he wants it to be. And we as God's people have a massive part to play in that. That he's going to work his renewal through us. Through us as salt and light, as a city, the church of Jesus Christ around the world, as a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And when we live for him, people turn to God and they praise God. So he's setting the strategy for renewal. The third thing he's doing is he speaks to one of the deepest needs that we all have. We all have a deep need to make a difference and to know that our lives have significance and that they matter. Jesus is queuing up for his disciples the reality that they are going to be world changers that will have eternal significance in the lives of others. I want you to be sure this morning that you know that if you are a Christian today, your life is meant to be spent on mission in the world, changing the world for Jesus. What we do together as a church is meant to change this community in Old Town and beyond and around the world. You are a world changer. Say that with me. I am a world changer. You know that little children's song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to make it shine. This, it's so catchy. It's terrible theology. People need to think when they write songs that Christians sing for centuries. The light in you is not a little light. It's not a little light. It's a big light. It's a light that will light up this world with the truth of Jesus Christ. It's not a little light. Somehow rewrite the lyrics so that this big light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Because it's the light of Christ. So let's dig a little bit deeper. What does Jesus mean by salt and light? Salt was used for several purposes in the first century. It's a beautiful and rich metaphor. Salt was such a valuable commodity in the first century that the Roman Empire would pay soldiers with salt. Salt was used as a purifier. Something would be given a salt bath if it needed to be purified. It's interesting during all the snow and all the weather of the, the last week or so, I had an opportunity to connect with neighbors in a deeper way. And I was talking with, with one of our, my neighbors and I don't know exactly what he thinks about Christianity. I know he really likes Jesus a lot because Jesus came up a lot. But he talked about two Christians in his workplace and it was interesting what he said. He said, everybody knows in my workplace that there's no and that's an interesting word, maliciousness about those guys. And I thought, what are they doing? They're living for Jesus in such a way that's so irresistible and so winsome that people in that workplace recognize there's something different. There's no maliciousness about those guys. Salt's also used as a preserver or preservative. Salt was used to preserve food from decaying. There were no deep freezers, no canned food in those days. If you had food and if it could not be eaten that day, then salt would be rubbed into it in a certain way to keep it from going bad and to keep it from spoiling. Have you ever, has anybody ever had country ham? You know, it's so salt, it makes your ankles swell up. I mean, it's, it's uh, but it's meant, you know, you put it in there so it doesn't go bad. As Christians, when we live out our faith, we actually have the ability to preserve the culture around us, to hinder decay, and to reverse decay. When we live the light and the salt of Christ around us, we can preserve culture in the name of Jesus. Salt is seasoning. Of course, salt adds flavor to otherwise bland food. Have you ever been on a diet and had air popped popcorn. Anybody ever had? It's like eating styrofoam cups. You may as well go to the church kitchen and get a styrofoam cup and say, I'm going to eat this. It's terrible. Salt doesn't stick to it, right? Because it's air popped. But salt adds seasoning. Salt flavors. I love how Peterson writes that we're here to bring the God flavors out in the world around us. And then salt was used, okay, 
Okay, this, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you're fertilizer. Salt was used as a fertilizer. Somebody say, I'm a fertilizer. Have you ever thought of yourself as fertilizer? But what salt would do, it would provide renewal nutrients as the spirit. Salt would provide renewal nutrients for the ground. And when you think about Christian living their lives, providing renewal nutrients to the world around us so that renewal and growth God's way to grow in the direction of God can happen through our lives. It's absolutely powerful. The metaphor of light is a little more straightforward. Jesus said we are light. Light in scripture represents truth in the Bible. It provides guidance and direction in the world. It illuminates the, the path of life so that we go in the right direction. A light stands as a beacon. And when Christ is flowing through his disciples, their light guides people away from darkness and evil and into the truth of Jesus. You are salt and you are light. When you live as salt, think about this. When you live as salt, people around you thirst for God. When you live as light, people around you can see and find their way to the truth of God. So put this together. Think about this for a moment. Hear the important role that you play in our world on behalf of Jesus. Remember, this is life in the other direction. Our world measures significance and importance by job title, by power, by position, by authority, by salary, by neighborhood, by brand, by label, by celebrity. That's how our culture defines power and influence. And we live in a town where people come to this town from both political parties or no political party, and they come to this town with sincere hearts to make a difference in our country and in our world. And good work happens. I don't care what any politician tells you, good work happens in this town. Good work happens. Many of you, as you go to work for the government, you do good work that changes the lives of people throughout this country and around the world. You make life better. Good work happens here. Good things happen here. That's why we're to pray for government, Scripture tells us. God uses government to bring peace and to do good. And we need to pray and we need to participate. Yet... His world renewal program, his work to make things right in this world that have been wrong, his work to defeat the forces of darkness and evil is not about power and prestige. It is not about a certain government philosophy. It is about, first and foremost, his disciples allowing his goodness to flow through him into this world. That's what it's about. It's not about your title or your rank, how many stars or bars or stripes are on your uniform. It's not about this set of ideas or this set of ideas. It's about God's people allowing the goodness of God to flow through them out into the world. It matters not if you ride a limo to work or you drive the limo to work. It matters not if you lobby on the halls of power or if you mop the halls of power. It matters that you release your heart to the flow of God's grace and allow that to flow through you in the world to be a world changer. Greater is he, Jesus said, that is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You're a world changer. You're salt and you're light. The way you live your life is absolutely irresistible. Now, before we move on to something very practical, and I'm going to wrap up here in just a little bit. Before we move on, Jesus says something really curious here. And you can't read this passage without tackling it. Isn't it, you know, you think you're just swimming along salt and light, shine, shine, shine. No, this is all good. And then Jesus lays in some tension. He always does. 
Jesus says, if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? If salt loses its saltiness, he not only says, what good is it? But it is to be thrown out and it is to be trampled. It is to be put in the garbage. So if salt loses its saltiness, it is useless and it should be thrown away. How does salt lose saltiness? Have you ever, have you ever wondered about that when you've, if you've read this passage? How does salt become all of a sudden unsalty? I'm no chemist, so I'm not going to go into a chemistry lesson this morning. But it is virtually impossible for sodium chloride, which is salt, to lose its saltiness. Because sodium chloride is extremely stable and it cannot change its nature. And when we read passages like this, we have to understand that Jesus was teaching about the essence of life in God's kingdom. And that he was not trying to teach a chemistry lesson. It's absurd to think salt can lose its flavor. It's absurd. It's absurd to think that you would light a lamp and then put a bowl on it right away. It's absurd. So in the Bible and in life, we essentially see three responses to the gospel of Jesus. We see the response of irreligion. In other words, people reject Jesus and they go their own way. They live the way they want to and they live a, way, a life of unbelief, irreligion. Another response we see to Jesus in the Bible is religion. People who hear the commands of God, they hear the ethical call to righteous living in the Sermon on the Mount, but they embrace what we talked about earlier, an outside-in righteousness. They perform these works with the idea that if I do all these good things, then I must be a Christian because God owes me, owes me salvation. That's another response. So have irreligion, religion, and then we have the gospel of grace. We covered that in the intro, but it's where we say, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I know I cannot earn my salvation. It's to say that I am so bad that Jesus needed to die for me, and I'm so loved that he was glad to die for me. Let me say that again. I am so bad that Jesus needed to die for me. I'm so loved that he was glad to die for me. And when your heart responds to the gospel of grace. When it is touched like that, good works flow out of you in joyful, glad obedience. Okay, so three responses to the gospel. Irreligion, just disbelief, don't believe, live your own way. Religion, try to earn your salvation, work your way to God, and every other religion goes that way. Or the gospel of grace, saying, I know I'm a sinner, I know I need Jesus, and when you receive that, joyful, glad obedience flows out of you. When Jesus says, if salt loses its saltiness, he's addressing the second group. He's addressing the, groups that, the group that says, I'm a Christian because of what I do. He's addressing Christians who are Christians in name only, but their hearts have not been changed and transformed by the grace of Jesus. People who say I'm a Christian, but they're not really saved is the simplest way to say that. He's saying that is not salty. That is not salty. The mark of an authentic disciple is a changed heart out of which flows salt and light that creates this compelling, irresistible thirst for God. So we're salt and we're light. But we're not robots. We have to yield our hearts to the grace and the flow of grace of God flowing through us. And when the writer of Hebrews says, throw off all the sin that so easily entangles, the writer of Hebrews is talking to Christians, throw sin off so that you can run the race and the grace of God can flow through you. Now I want to wrap up. Two minutes, I promise, with this. What does the disciple look like in real life? In other words, if we can actually hinder this flow of grace, how can we prepare ourselves and our hearts so that the God's grace does flow through us. Well, let me encourage you to do this. One, pray the Isaiah prayer daily. Isaiah 6, 8 says, 
Isaiah captured a vision for the Lord. And he says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said to the Lord, Here am I, send me. I want to challenge you to consider making that the very first prayer that you pray in the morning. When you think about your influence in the world where you live, work, and play. Instead of your first prayer being, Lord, help me make it through another day. How about, Lord, here am I, send me. Where do you want me to go? The second thing is break out of the huddle. Next week, the Carolina Panthers and the Denver Broncos will play in the Super Bowl. And the teams have been preparing all season. They've been practicing. They've been designing plays. And when both teams start to go, their offense will get on the field. They'll gather up in a huddle. They'll call a play. And then they're going to break the huddle. And they're going to run the play, right? Well, in Christian life, if we're not careful, Christians can stay in the huddle. And we can call plays all day. We can learn the playbook all day. We can read over and over and over in the Bible. What should we do? Bible study and all this, all good stuff. But if we're not careful, we stay in the huddle. We've got to call the play, break the huddle, and go run the play. And so I encourage you, as disciples of Jesus meant to change the world, audit your time. How much time are you spending in the huddle with church folks how much time are you spending out of the huddle on mission for Jesus? You've heard me say over and over and over, we're meant to be scattered and gathered. Okay? Gather means we gather for worship. We gather for worship and Bible study and encouragement and fellowship and da 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 And then we scatter on mission in the world. And we have to get this balanced. Right? You see, if all we are is gathered then eventually our faith muscles won't be strong and eventually we'll turn inward and actually eventually we start being critical of each other. Kind of like a family when you've been snowed in for a week in a blizzard. You know, we got to get out. You can't be gathered all the time. You got to be scattered on mission. If all we are is scattered and we don't gather, and we say, you know what, I can love Jesus, I don't need the church. I can love Jesus, I can worship Jesus on the park bench down by the river, and I can do good deeds, I can go volunteer at the shelter, da 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 Then you run the risk of believing that you change the world by your own deeds rather than the grace of God flowing through you, which often flows through the church. And really what you are is an independent Christian activist rather than a member of the body of Christ locally seeking to work together with a family on mission, gathered and scattered. How much time are you spending in the huddle? How much time are you spending out on mission in the world? And then lastly, consider this. Remember the outcome. Jesus said, you're salt and light. You're going to do all these wonderful things, not so that you get your name on a plaque or the name on a stained glass window or the name over a church or the name on a library, or your name on a carpenter's shelter. Jesus didn't say, you're going to do all these good things so that people will know what you did. He said, you're going to do all these good things so that people praise God. So that people praise God. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? To live our lives and to spend our lives in such a way that even pagans would look at the way Christians live, look at the way we live, and say, oh my goodness, what a good and what an awesome God. All God's people said? Amen. Dave, come lead us in our last song.